Once upon a time, there was a girl who dreamed of flying through the stars. Her name is May. When May was little, her head was full of questions. How did life on Earth start? What happened to the dinosaurs? Where do stars come from? Whenever May asked her mom these things, she got the same answer. Look it up, her mom said. So May went to the library again and again. She dove into piles of books. She invented science experiments with her older brother and sister. And she read made-up stories, too. Her favorites were ones about aliens who zoomed from one planet to another on spaceships. It was 1961. We choose to go to the moon. And President Kennedy had promised to to land a man on the moon by the end of the decade. At night, May stared up at the twinkling stars. She imagined ships flying between them, their rockets burning bright. And when she closed her eyes, she saw herself floating in space in a bulky spacesuit, waving down at her city, Chicago. One day, she promised herself, she would make her dream come true. I'm Emily Calandrelli, and this is Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls, a fairy tale podcast about the rebel women who inspire us. This week, Mae Jemison. One afternoon, when May was sitting in her elementary school classroom, her teacher asked a question. What do you want to be when you grow up? Hands shot up around the room. I want to be a fireman. I want to be a teacher. May raised her hand into the air, her brown eyes twinkling. I want to be a scientist, she said. The teacher's eyebrows pinched together. Don't you mean nurse? May put her hands on her hips and said, No, I mean a scientist. In the 1960s, most scientists in the United States were men and white. May was a girl and she was black. But May didn't care if scientists didn't look like her. All she knew was that she wanted to explore and do experiments and study how the world worked. She knew that was her future, no matter what her teacher or anyone else said. A few years later, May was sitting in her living room, her eyes glued to the black and white images on her television screen. It was July 20th, 1969, and astronauts were about to land on the moon. May watched the moon's surface on the screen, all the craters and dips. She held her breath until the craft finally touched down. May got goosebumps as she watched Neil Armstrong's feet gently bounce across the moon's dusty surface. May thought it would be amazing to walk on the moon. Maybe by the time she was an adult, May could even go to Mars. Here's the thing. Back when May was a child, none of the astronauts on the Apollo missions looked like her. When the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, was created in 1958, all the astronauts were military pilots, and all of them were white men. Still, May knew a different future was possible. Why? because she saw it on Star Trek. Star Trek was a big TV show when May was a kid. 
On Star Trek, people of many races and genders work together on the starship Enterprise. They flew to new planets and met different beings from around the universe. And on the bridge of that starship stood communication officer, Lieutenant Uhura, an important officer and a black woman. Maybe one day, May thought, NASA would look more like Star Trek. And when it did, she would be ready to fly. At just 16 years old, May graduated high school at the top of her class. She received a National Achievement Scholarship that paid for college and left Chicago for California, where she started at Stanford University. There, she studied chemical engineering and African-American studies. She also learned a bunch of languages, performed in theater productions, and was a dancer. When May graduated in 1977, she still wanted to fly among the stars. But first, she was determined to help people on her own planet. So, May studied medicine and traveled around the world, helping people in Cuba, Kenya, and Thailand. She provided medical care in small villages and in refugee camps. Then, after graduating from medical school, May joined the Peace Corps, a program of the U.S. government that sends volunteers to developing countries around the world. It was hard work, and she was on call all the time. She learned so much about health, wellness, and how to treat patients. And then, in 1985, May returned to the U.S. It was time to explore a new frontier. Space. By that time, NASA's astronauts looked differently than they did in 1969. In 1983, Guyan Bluford made history as the first Black astronaut. And that same year, Sally Ride was the first American woman to enter space. So, May called the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. I would like an application to be an astronaut, she said. To her surprise, they sent her one immediately. She filled it out, mailed it in, and waited taking some engineering courses while she did. But then, something terrible happened. On a freezing winter morning in late January 1986, the space shuttle Challenger launched into the bright blue Florida sky. Suddenly, the Challenger exploded. Flight controllers here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. People watching live and on TV gasped and covered their eyes. After that, NASA suspended the space shuttle project. May's heart hurt for the astronauts who lost their lives on the Challenger. And May knew there were risks involved in any kind of exploration. But there was also so much to learn and discover. So, when NASA reopened their astronaut training program in October 1986, May applied again. In 1987, out of 2,000 applicants, and after many interviews and tests, May was one of 15 people chosen for NASA's astronaut training program. For a whole year, May trained with the other astronauts-to-be, they took classes on science, technology, and about how the space shuttle itself worked. They learned how to operate all the equipment. They were even trained on how to survive in the wilderness, fly in jets, and operate a parachute. One of the most interesting parts of their training was learning to live in zero gravity. On Earth, gravity holds people's feet to the ground. But in space, there is no gravity. Astronauts float. 
As part of May's training, she flew in a plane that recreated zero gravity conditions by flying up and down in a special looping pattern. As May floated weightless in the air for 30 seconds at a time, she had to figure out how to work the shuttle's equipment and even practice eating. Finally, in 1988, May completed the program. She was now the first Black woman to ever be an astronaut. On September 12th, 1992, May stepped into her bright orange spacesuit and walked proudly onto launch pad 39B at the Kennedy Space Center. The space shuttle Endeavour stood like a tower, its nose pointed straight up toward the sky. May and six other astronauts boarded the shuttle and got strapped in. As the countdown began, May's heart raced. Butterflies filled May's belly. A huge grin grew across her face. As the shuttle's rockets roared to life, May's seat shuddered beneath her. Her body pressed back as the shuttle shot into the sky. Up and up and up they flew, through the clouds and the bright sunny sky, and then finally, finally, May was in space. When the Endeavour entered orbit above the Earth, May's eyes widened in amazement. The planet was glowing and beautiful and blue. May remembered looking out her own window as a child, staring up at the twinkling stars. Now here she was, looking back down at her hometown. What would my younger self have thought if she had met me? May wondered. I think she would have been tickled. As May watched the Earth spin by below, she couldn't stop smiling if she tried. May traveled around the Earth in the Endeavor for 3.3 million miles, or 126 orbits. As the Endeavor soared around the planet, May's spirits did too. On board the shuttle, May couldn't help but think of Lieutenant Uhura from Star Trek. On one of her first shifts, May broke with NASA protocol and radioed down to Earth. Huntsville, Endeavor, all hailing frequencies open. Just like Lieutenant Uhura used to say. But May also had a job to do. She and her crewmates conducted more than 44 experiments. They hatched frogs' eggs and studied what happened to them in zero gravity. They grew well and lived. They observed the behavior of hornets and examined whether they built nests. They didn't. And May even did an experiment on herself. Zero gravity often causes uncomfortable side effects, including nausea. So, May hooked herself up to special equipment and studied whether meditation and other similar activities helped her feel better. They did. Eight days after its launch, the Endeavour headed back to Kennedy Space Center. A voice said over the comm system, You're still go. Surface winds are calm. The Endeavour's wheels gently touched the runway's asphalt. A big red and white chute deployed behind the shuttle as it slowed to a stop. In their blue NASA uniforms, Dr. Mae Jemison and the six other astronauts stepped out into the bright sun, smiling and waving. Back in Chicago, Mae was greeted with parades and celebrations. She made special appearances on television, and she gave speeches around the country. Her dream, and the dreams of many before her, had finally come true. In the years following her spaceflight, May left NASA for other endeavors. She taught at Dartmouth and Cornell universities started her own science and technology company, and launched a science education program for kids. 
She even appeared on an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, a spinoff of the very show that inspired her when she was a girl. She never stopped reaching for the stars. May is now leading an innovative project called the 100-Year Starship. This project aims to create the technology and resources we need to send humans to another star system, light years away, in the next 100 years. With collaboration and hard work, May believes we can make this impossible dream possible. For her, for you, for everyone. podcast is a production of Rebel Girls. It's based on the book series, Goodnight Stories for Rebel Girls. Executive producers are Jess Wolf and Katie Springer. This episode was produced by Isaac Kaplan-Wolner. Sound design and mixing by Louise Miranda. Corinne Peterson is our production manager. This episode was written by Alexis Stratton. Proofread by Ariana Rosas. It was narrated by Emily Calandrelli who we will get to know better on Thursday's episode. Original theme music was composed and performed by Electra Barjaki. For more, visit rebelgirls.com. Until next time, stay rebel!